ah, hello, person who is talking about things. You you seem like a good person. <laughs> and then and then like they come back to me and they're like, hey, remember when we talked last time? And I'm like, yes, I totally remember every word of that. This is Podkit, episode 28. It's called an iframe on April 1st, 2017. And now his name is Trello. This episode of Podkit is hosted by Brandon Johnson, Brian Mitchell, and Ryan Rampersed. This episode has show notes at thenexus.tv slash PK28. Hello. Hi, everybody. Hi. Long time no no here. We actually have some follow-up here. All right. Sitting, this has been sitting in my inbox since December 16th. And wait, from wait. Our... Are, you, are you telling me that this is being recorded in April and we have feedback from, <laughs> from approximately December. four months ago? It, Literally from last year. Oh my. It, ha- it has been three and a half months since the podcast. That's I an apologize. entire financial quarter. That's an entire financial quarter. A lot has happened. But don't worry, we're planning on another episode in roughly two weeks. So <laughs> I thought you were going to say two years. <laughs> well, I... <laughs> I can with confidence say we will record another one within two years. I agree. Hopefully two weeks as well. Right. So our our, our feedback is from the, the one and only Andrew Bailey. Um, he's saying, I don't even remember what this is about anymore, but I'll just read it here and we'll, um, we'll see what we can understand. All right. I'll so, look it up in the show notes too for last episode. With regards to podcast episode number 27, join the bi-weekly bandwagon. Oh gosh, we've failed on that. <laughs> It is a comfortable midpoint between being not forever between episodes and all the time. Probably the best innovation for CS, which is control structure. Um, we definitely have. It's, it has been a long time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, he has a comment for Ryan saying, feel like banging your head against a wall about your MongoDB and spring frustrations. Yeah, those are the worst. And then he says, Brandon is right. Ryan is wrong. Python is pseudocode, never Java. Pseudocode should never have redundant syntax. And he also says, Ryan, I'm pretty sure that you can get LibreOffice without Java. Sounded like we talked about Java and... We did. Look at that. Yeah, some good thing things. I don't have to do that anymore. No more Java. Java's done. Though I saw you you did write some Java this last week. I tried. I closed the text editor like mere moments after I opened it. We well, had enough to tweet about it and still say that you did a little bit, right? Uh, I did. One file's worth. Good. Nice. Well, that's more Java than I've written in the last two years. So. Well, there you go. <laughs> oh my goodness! No, actually, that's a lie. I worked on CMS v3 at one point. So uh, I ran into a JRuby app a little bit ago, Ooh. a very old JRuby app, which um, wasn't working out of the box because uh, the version of the Twitter gem that it was using mm-hmm. was so old oh. that it, they yanked it. They actually removed it from Ruby gems, so it's impossible to download. Uh, so I just had to upgrade it like four major versions, and everything was fine. <laughs> Oh, perfect. Well, that's pretty it, lucky. Is Ruby, Ruby written or implemented with Java? Mm-hmm. Oh, that's interesting. The thing. Yep, JRuby is kind of intriguing. Well, um, you know, it's just like Iron Python, Python that yeah. runs on the .NET CL, CLR. Or, or Jython. Yeah. Right, don't, yeah, yeah. yeah no, 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 no yeah. none of that nonsense. Yep. I've used Jython before. I think it's For really cool. Time, I love that kind of stuff. Admittedly, I have not, but um, it's... It's intriguing to me. I, I'm a fan of um, uh, Rubinius. Is that the one? Rubinius. That's the one that is a Ruby interpreter written in Ruby. <laughs> yeah. Um, I haven't used it in a long time, but it's also pretty pretty interesting. Like languages that have like a bootstrapping compiler, a bootstrapping interpreter are kind of intriguing. Oh, well, then um, you're going to love Rust. I know. I know. Uh, I do love Rust. Did I, I don't know if I ever told you all about this, but uh, I did a mini super ridiculous side project when I was watching uh, a little bit of uh, or when I had an HBO go trial Mm -hmm. and or an HBO now trial in like um, December or January. Um, And uh, let me see. So the, the idea was I was going to try and make something that could generate profound quotes off of like Markov, Markov chains from, uh, from like Friedrich Nietzsche and a couple of religious texts and also like, um, like Donald Trump tweets. Oh my. Right. And it would just, it would just be like the weirdest mashup of stuff in, in, in anything. It was like, it was pretty awful. Um, which is why I never did anything with it, but it was also kind of like frighteningly hilarious because like you could get things out of it and it would be so random. 
Yeah. But it would be um, like you could see how if somebody were just posting this, folks, you know, the the like insight behind this because of course uh, HBO now has like lots of really good content about like fringe religions, fringe spirituality, and right uh, and cults. And I was like, oh man, what if there was like a cult, but like the thing, the object of the cult, like the 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 uh, ob- object of worship was like a Twitter bot, <laughs> right? Oh, is no. that like is that horrifying or what? Um, so I was like, well, what what would that look like if I were to try and, um, yeah? So like, as as you can tell, it was probably a good idea to stop that pretty soon because eventually you start getting into the realm of like a bunch of weird stuff that probably you don't want to ever uh ever run into yeah um but it was super interesting and i i hope i can find on here some of that text because it was really good ah it's on the other partition of this machine which i don't think i can access because i'm on the windows side right now next boot next boot yes on next boot uh or maybe i have it now i so on this computer i don't have my work slack so i did send it to somebody in slack at work though i well i'll find it i'll post it and it'll be vaguely entertaining for sure um so yeah, Rust and Markov, ch- Markov chains are fun. Yep. Must have been nice so, and fast. What what has everyone done in the last three and a half months? Just a, a brief catch up and a minute per person. Anything anything notable? So I've done two releases of the React Native app I've been working on, which is super fun. Um, one of which uh, implemented a kind of uh, what we'll call an analytics SDK, which is super fun because I had to write the native bindings for that, um, which is... Which is a, a hugely interesting endeavor, um, which we'll probably talk about a little later. And the last one was like a super awesome maintenance release where uh, basically focused on rewriting a lot of the logic with pure functions. Uh, nice. Not not like a lot of the logic, but probably like a, a solid 10% of the logic in certain things with with pure functions and RAM to JS and all that fun stuff. Um, so I, we might very well be the largest use of RAM to JS in production on a native app. Hmm. Um well, every time, fun. every time you you added more to that phrase, it became less impressive. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, I mean, we might we might be the largest the largest production use of Ramda JS ever. But there you go. It's probably probably more likely that I'm sure somebody uses it more than we do. Um, yeah, but yeah. What about you, Ryan? So since we last spoke, I am no longer working in the typical Doherty office. I have actually moved out to a client site. Ah, uh, yeah. And uh, so that that's pretty much been my past few months. Um, right on. Um, and, and I um, recently did a uh, Vue.js talk uh, for a tech night at Doherty. So that was a lot yeah, of fun. Yeah, right As on. well as JavaScript Minnesota. Yeah, and, and JavaScript Minnesota. Um, the, one, the, the second one, the, the tech night I did for Doherty was quite a bit more basic than the previous one. So Yeah, well, the audience is a little different, too. Yeah. That's pretty cool. much it. Well, let's see. I a lot has happened. I bought a car. I moved to Minneapolis. I have gigabit internet. Uh, I'm switching projects at work. Might go back to the old lobby visualization one, but I'm on a analytics application, so I'm working with another JavaScript developer, which is nice. That is having good. Not solo on the entire project. In terms of work, there's more to be done, but I can ask for help and work together with him. Um. Oh gosh, what else? Uh, I went to Minibar 12 a week ago. That was that was quite cool. Um, I think I'll definitely go back in the future. I don't know if you guys have done that at all. but Yeah, I went to Minibar last year. Okay. Uh, and it was super awesome. I went there volunteering, actually, which is how I got in. Um, it was super, super neat. Lots of cool talks. Uh, unfortunately, that weekend, I like lost my voice, and I was supposed to go there for mm-hmm. JavaScript event. So like, it's kind of not great for... <laughs> Somebody who can't talk to represent a meetup group. Turns yeah. out. <laughs> Turns out. Yeah, I, I would have liked to go. I, I was busy that weekend, but, um, you know, it, it is sort of right by the Doherty office, so I would have probably gone with other people. I, some other people from work did go, so I was happy for them. That's awesome. Okay. Yep. Yeah. I met up with some um, UMM alums and current students, as well as a professor, and then afterwards we all went out for dinner. So it's kind of a nice um, to hear about what's going on at the school, changes they're doing to classes and the lab environments and things so definitely yeah it's brilliant it's a great it's a long but really fun day yeah for sure that is that is one thing i'll say about mini bars it's like ah oh, eight until like whenever you go home yeah i know which it, can be it, never it is really long yeah if, if you're not lucky it's so that if i recall correctly they host that in the best buy space right that's yep. where it was this yep. year too um the 
the the thing about that Best Buy office is if you're not careful, you, you might never leave. It's like it's, it's like place. voluminous. Yeah, yeah. Like we, uh, I had a professor who was the CCO of Best Buy uh, for a little while, which was super fascinating. Oh wow! And we toured, we toured their offices, and it was very much like that. It was like, aha, yeah. If we're not escorted here, we're gonna get lost, and then someday, you know, I'll end up at like a, I'll, w- I'll wake up at a Best Buy store in Tucson, Arizona. <laughs> be like, how did I get here? And you'll be one hundred and fifty percent marked up in price. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Well, be while wearing khakis and a blue polo shirt. There oh, you go. Man. Yeah, right, right. Uh, I do have I do have one piece of follow up that is super ridiculous and like not related to anything we were just talking about though. I noticed that our last episode, episode 27 is called Trello as a proxy, and I just wanted to mention that the Nintendo Switch, uh the main game for the Nintendo Switch that's out right now is uh Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. And in there there's a character named Trello and he's a jerk. He's like this old dude in Zora's domain and he's just like I don't like you, Link. Your link, and I don't like you. And his name is Trello. So anytime I interact with Trello, I took a screenshot um, because I thought that it's just hilarious that, like, this, yeah, his name is Trello. Um, and uh, I will put those in the show notes, links to those in the show notes, because that's just awesome and hilarious. And I can't help but laugh every time I see that dude. <laughs> I can't, I can't help but laugh either, I guess. Right, right, right. I'm like, oh, maybe I should give Trello some tasks so he's not so much of a jerk. Oh my gosh. Gosh darn it. <laughs> That's funny. All right. So uh looks like our first topic on the list is USB C and iPhone eight. Mm-hmm. I think I think I put this in there a month ago when it was uh <laughs> when it broke. I heard a, a bunch of stuff about it on podcasts, but I know we've talked about USB C in the past and going towards the standard. And yeah. I can't recall what the the tech sphere has concluded if they're if it's going to have USB C or just come with a Lightning to USB C cable. But I am sincerely hoping that it uses USB C. I have enough peripherals that use USB C now that I'm kind of like all in on it. My laptop doesn't have a USB C port natively, but everyone else at work, a, a good portion of folks at work, have the uh, MacBook Pro that only have USB Type C ports. Yep. Um, so with with that and and with like the Nintendo Switch and the Nexus Six P that Ryan so graciously offered me so that I could use it for React Native development, um, like that's just it's so awesome. It's so awesome to have a unified, um, well, a universal serial bus. Believe it or not, oh. so it's so awesome to have that. Um, and I I just hope that we can get there sooner rather than later. I'm probably not going to end up getting one of those MacBook Pros from from the office just because I my MacBook Pro is relatively recent um but those other folks have had theirs for two years or so 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 i'm still rocking my four and a half year old 2012 retina display mac pro yeah I, I realized yesterday i think i was talking slack i need this year i'm probably well maybe not all this yeah. year but new macbook pro new ipad a bed and all the bedding because i'm using a twin bed i've had since i was three and a nas and so that's a lot of things to spend i don't think i'll update my desktop because that's from 2013 but i just got up to 24 gigs of RAM in there instead of 16. So that should last it a little while longer. But, yeah, no, totally. And I also am toying with the idea of if the iPhone 8 gets a sweet update like the Samsung S8, the Galaxy S8, maybe I'll update that in the fall too. And that's just even more of a hole in my pocket. Yeah. No, I getcha. I getcha. Yeah, when I when I moved down here, I was much in the same boat. I'm like, well, I have a desktop, but I kind of want to rebuild it. And also I need a bed. <laughs> and also a desk and also all all of this other stuff and yep first couple of months were large money sinks i i also got an iphone 7 at that point so yeah yeah i bought a desk a nice stand stand this which i'm standing at right now yes yeah, right on um i just bought an adapter for my desktop so i can switch to my server case so i can put the apple broadcom wireless card into a mpci slot so i bought this adapter that came from china about 20 that's days awesome. after that's awesome yeah hope it'll work so that'll be my my quote new desktop as i mm. you know new case same desktop really but. right on but yeah USB C. uh my apple tv 4 is the only device i have with USB C on it and i have never used it because i don't own any USB C cables wait mm-hmm. an apple tv has a usb type c yep it's that's for be- diagnostics no, that's and so bizarre developing. it's so developers can plug into xcode with it through a computer um the apple tv Two and three had a micro USB port, which I believe is one of the 
only products that Apple makes that has a micro USB peep. That's even USB more bizarre. Wow. I had no idea. Um, I would love for the iPhone to have Type-C. Um, it'd be nice if they did it. I just, I I feel like they won't because that's, you know, they will they won't be able to make uh, $30 per cable anymore. Mm-hmm. I don't think they ultimately care too much about making money off of the cables. I think one benefit you have from Lightning is uh, an insured standard because USB Type-C has several issues with different versions of it even already now yep and um different requirements for the cables for different devices so you know you can't plug in your average USB-C cable and charge a macbook pro especially a 15 inch you have to use special cables and right so while it's the same connectors it's you really do need different cables for different things yeah um and lightning kind of solves that because it's one for everything um the lightning connector can also fit inside of a usb type c connector so it is a, it is a larger connector, not by a lot, but a little bit larger. Yep. So that's something that they probably are juggling with as well. I hope they do it. I yeah, do too. for sure. Well, so if you if you did want to see sort of what the future looks like, so uh, earlier <laughs> this week, this um, this amazing phone called the Galaxy S8 came out from, from, from the, the Samsung. The Samsung. Yes. And so what I, what I really like about it is just the screen. I don't. I don't. I don't have much to say about the processor because there's nothing to write home about it for, but the screen is the best part. So the screen, wow, these monitors sure do not like this website. Um, oh, no. <laughs> so the screen is um, sort of, sort of similar to the previous generations of the galaxy phones, like the S six and S seven, specifically the um, S seven edge. So the, yep. the screen kind of wrapped around the sides so the the wrapping isn't as extreme anymore, but the the there are no side bezels now, mm-hmm. and the and the bottom and top bezels are much smaller, extremely small. Um, I would say probably just like pen width size on the mm-hmm. top and bottom. So it's it's really nice uh, when you look at it, and um, you know it's it's priced pretty similar to uh, what I think an iPhone is priced around these days. What's an mm-hmm. iPhone run these days? Depending That's, on what you want, seven hundred. If it's off contract, yeah, three hundred. If it's on contract, right. So yeah, I think an S eight is seven hundred and fifty, and you get sixty four gigs with you know external upgradable storage. So mm-hmm. pretty pretty comparable there. Um, I mean, what a, what a nice um, way to make a phone. But now, when you actually compare this to like an iPhone or even the Pixel, like even the Pixel I have, it the Pixel and the iPhone just look ancient compared to it. I, I would say at least from a front on point of view, yeah, this phone looks super sleek and modern and I I I do think um it's probably telling of what the iPhone S or seven S or eight or whatever the next one might might look more like because there's been rumors for all all smartphones for the last couple of years about edge to edge displays. Mm-hmm. Um and this looks how I would imagine it, you know, a very small bezel on the top and bottom and next to no bezel on the side. Yeah, I I hope this is what they do with that uh, iPhone eight or whatever the next one is. Um, I really hope that other vendors can get the screen tech fairly soon, um, because they need to. Um, mm-hmm. Phones won't be able to look like the Pixel or the iPhone anymore after this. Yeah. No. Yeah. I, I do you know anything about the so the screens look like they have rounded corners. Do you know what what that is? Is it is the screen built with no pixels up there so they can round it? Or um, I actually don't know that. Um, incidentally, though, the, um, what is it called? Uh, the LG G6 has rounded corners, too. And, yeah. and when people were taking screenshots on that, they were just normal straight edges. So it, it's probably just kind of clipping yeah. what, what it's rendering. Yeah. And, and, I would right. as, and I would assume the, the OS you know can position the elements a little bit away from those if they're smart. Yeah. Yep. Nice. Yeah, this looks promising. I'll I'll definitely check it out when so, I when I see one. So these are coming out sometime later th- this month. Um, so let's see, the twenty first, I think. So mm-hmm. I I might get one, just just for fun. Do it. Um. So we'll see. Right on. Yep. Nice. Okay. So next, um, Vue.js. So earlier in the show, I mentioned I did a Vue.js talk at Doherty. Um, you can follow the link I have in the show notes for that. Um, their slides are up, the code's up. Um, you can kind of follow that along if you want to. You know, it was sort of like an introduction. Um, you know, kind of like um, 
you know, here's here are the simple parts of view, and then we did some view components, view CLI, view router, view X, full stack stuff. Um, you know, since we last talked, I said, hey, you know, I really wanted to learn Vue X. Well, it turns out I did. So, um, you know, one of these days when uh, JavaScript Minnesota does um, a lightning talk night, I can talk about Vue X, I guess. Yeah, next time. Next yeah. time. So what I really wanted to talk about in this section was uh, we had we had a great um, question sort of come out of that talk at the end in the Q&A section. And that was, so why would I pick Vue versus something else? That's a great, legit question, right? So, you know, everybody knows that Angular 2 is literally the best and most front-leading framework out there. Oh, wait, no, I lied. No. React is. Um, yes. And and so I love the idea of React. Um, Vue offers some upfront, um, lower barriers to entry that sure. you don't have to pay for at all to just get started, whereas maybe, maybe React has a more rigorous kind of tooling and pattern um but but one of the things that you know like we we were i was asked and we sort of discussed as our as our group there was so what's the expectation of technology being around now for a prolonged period of time so if you look at what happened to angular one it was out for like five years and then just evaporated uh i'm still using it (laughs) well turns out for new development nobody wants to do that um and and that's part of the thing so there are still people using tech now, like Angular 1, and probably what will become Angular 2, and then 4, and then 20 within three Four years. Four out now. So. I know. Um, so, like, what, what, are, what are our expectations of, of these JavaScript things hanging around? Like, can we believe that React will be around for 10 years? That's a really good question. And uh, as somebody who does React essentially full-time, React and React Native, um, it... I don't necessarily know if that will be the case. I think these ideas will stick around, yeah. But I don't know if React itself will will stick around in the way that it's called uh, in the way that we currently know about it. Mm-hmm. Um, I know that there are a couple of uh, things that are a couple of projects to essentially rewrite React. Yep. Um, which is kind of bonkers to me, right? Um, because like, wasn't React just recently written a couple of years back? Sort of. Um, but yeah, right, right. But then rewrite, rewriting it makes a lot of sense too, because there are a lot of a lot of performance benefits, a lot of um, a lot of optimizations that, like, essentially the first time, the first go around, nobody really knew how to handle it. Exactly. Uh, or, or they had to handle it in the way that they could at, at that point, and now, now that there are new opportunities for things. One of the things that I dislike most about React Native is the uh, React Native in particular, but also React React in general is like this idea that you don't just use plain ES6. Right. Uh, you you have to kind of uh, compile, compile uh, you know, ES7 features and a bunch of other weird, like, hodgepodges that don't actually match any iteration of the language as we know it. Right. Uh, down to ES6. Yep. Uh, to be executed on, like, uh, JavaScript core or mm-hmm. whatever the VM that... I guess it is V8 probably, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, that- yeah they use on android Mm -hmm. but it's just like it's just like man i don't want to i don't want to do that i want to be able to try out react native code um on uh you know just pull in a couple of the things i need and test it out in a node repl or something like that why why don't we have that yep um that constantly annoys me but um it just is another reason why i practice tdd in (laughs) in uh react native because otherwise i lose my mind um but like it's stuff like that that makes me think that React itself, in the way that it currently is, this like hodgepodge of polyfills on polyfills yep. on polyfills, is probably not going to last uh, in the way that we know it. Hopefully, it will become easier to just just um, start to, and just use it. Exactly. Right. Exactly. And I, I mean, right. this is this is a problem that's not uh, exclusive to React by any means. I'm sure Vue has run into many of the same things. But as you oh, mentioned, absolutely. there are a lot of things that that Vue gets for free. Yep. That Vue provides you for free that react doesn't exactly. Ember has a lot of the same issues as well yep uh where it's like at what point are you learning ember and not really javascript mm-hmm. yeah i think there's there's um a lot of stuff about react that i like a lot yeah. and there's a lot of things i don't necessarily like that much um so for example i like being able to, to write html templates i like that it's a nice feature for sure um i don't need everything to literally be a component with this magic jsx doing who knows what under right. the hood but you 
you you can't write just HTML templates when you want to do um, native stuff because you know those elements don't actually exist in the native version. So that's why those elements are JSX components in the native version. So that's there's a reason for some of this stuff. Right. Um, so when I was asked this question, I I kind of said the same thing. So I don't I don't think Vue would be what you would want to use if you wanted something to last this magical ten years for business. But mm-hmm. on the other hand, even if you pick Vue, it won't be worse really than picking React because it probably won't be the same anyway. I mean, if they break their API or they decide to just abandon it, you're out of luck. Um, React Fiber is coming out later this year, and that's the mm-hmm. internal core rewrite, yep. um, which comes with a bunch of new features. And presumably the API will stay the same, but who really knows? Right. So I, I think... Um, at least for the front end, I think the the days of having something stick around for ten years, that's gone. Right, I totally agree. And like another thing to to add to this might be that like any application that you expect to last for ten years won't really last for ten exactly. years. Exactly. It might it might run for ten years, right? But it won't it won't be maintainable for ten years. No. Like that's I, in no. the fringe. I was talking about a, a something that I took a look at that was uh, about four or five years old, mm-hmm. five or six, seven years old maybe. Um, but uh, and it used Ruby, you know, it it used Ruby, but um, and, and it used Ruby gems too, and a lot of patterns that are still common today. But it's just the fact that a lot of those dependencies are so old and can't yep. really be updated, right? Uh, to assure the same functionality that, like, yeah, it's it's not maintainable. It's not to de- you can't develop that application any further. You need to do a rewrite. Yep. Um, but I think one of the things that front end frameworks give you is the opportunity to build front ends relatively quickly quickly and simply and, simply and rather inexpensively, I guess, and, and for some definition of expensive. Right. I totally um, agree. And so if you if you make your API rock solid, mm-hmm. right? If you make the thing that you get data from rock solid, uh, or better yet, like if, if if you don't need an API in reality, you're just reading from data, from static data, mm-hmm. maybe what you do then is use a front end framework a front end framework that is uh, that uh, is part of a static site generator or something mm-hmm. like that, right? Like Gatsby JS, which which uses React, but the thing you generate is static. Yeah. Um, that this like um, incremental trans transition of state from data to UI, right? This or this this like idea of converting data into UI is like the thing that will persist and you can do that with whatever will exist in 10 years. And if yeah. you think about applications that way, instead of how can the thing I write now last 10 years or last forever? Yep. Like that's, that's just never going to, nobody's going to like that. Yeah. I, I said that I think the um, idea of components will exist in 10 years yeah. for sure, because this component idea, it's so nice and so simple and so elegant. Mm-hmm. It, it, it holds abstraction so well. And as we all know, composability is so much better than inheritance. Absolutely. So yes. I think that's the thing that'll last. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, this has been a great discussion because I needed to know if I was the crazy one. No, not at all. Not at all. I think, I mean, mm-hmm. go I for think it. something good about um, front-end code is, I mean, I, I presume it's still going to be more or less JavaScript in 10 years. Um, so I think a lot of the stuff that we have nowadays, we can copy our templates, replace a few things, and we can probably get it to work with not a ridiculous amount of effort, as long as our our logic and things is still gonna function. You know, and you know, if we're doing a full rewrite of the API as well, then maybe we have to do a lot more of a rewrite. But we can, we do have the ability to just kind of copy over if we're still using components, at least if the app is st- structured in a reasonable way. I think, I mean, I haven't tried this, but I I would imagine I could, you know, transition my Angular one app at work to something like Vue.js without too much work. I could probably do it in a week or two. Incidentally, and, that's true. I've done it. Yeah. And so I think if things keep kind of moving in the way they have, I think it won't be, I don't think maintainability will quite mean the exact same structure. Mm-hmm. It might mean, okay, we have this thing. Angular one is being end of life. We need to move it to something else. Let's figure out what that is. Spend a, spr- a few sprints moving it over. It's not a rewrite, but it is a large maintenance release and a, you know, you know, it lasting for 10 years is okay. When we have to stop and rewrite the whole thing Mm -hmm. versus use the exact same stack. Exactly. Exactly. Like changing out those, those components is what is, is what's going to be the new kind of idea of maintenance rather than keeping everything exactly the same. Right. And, uh, and just updating what's, what's there because otherwise you have a world of hurt. 
well, the world to hurt. I think there's two ways to, you can kind of look at that. Like, if you already have an existing app, a lot of what mm-hmm. went into that app was thinking about what you wanted the app to be. You already mm-hmm. done. You've already done that. So when you rewrite it again, you don't have to take all the time to think about what you want it to be. You you already have a place to start from. You can just go. You just for plug sure. and chug for a month and hope right. it works. Yeah, and and I, and I think that's that's one of the most important things um, about rewriting. You already know what you need and how how you've done it. Now you can just go do it again in for a new sure. in a new you know system. But the other thing is, I've I've also been learning a lot of stuff or or attempting to learn a lot of stuff about microservices. And mm-hmm. so the idea of microservices on the server side, at least, is so to kind of be like, well. You know, instead of having to refactor this or perform maintenance on this thing to add more functionality or to fix bugs, let's just rewrite it. It's easier. Mm-hmm. It'll, it's a thousand lines. That's what a microservice is. No problem. So maybe, maybe someday, I don't know, if, I don't think we have it yet, but maybe there will be something sort of more like a microservice on the client side, on the browser that is level. That's a really interesting idea. Um, totally. Where, where yeah. you have really these like kind that. of components that are interoperable. They can be with whatever framework you want. I don't right. really know what that would be. Maybe like a web component, maybe. Um, you use whatever you want inside of it, but it has this mm-hmm. kind of clean interface on the outside. And then you're just good to go. So Absolutely. I mean so that would be something like a like a universal uh client side API for components. Common mo- components. Yeah. Somehow. I like that. That's yeah. a really good idea. So We're like, already partially there with the idea of like imb- like you can embed a React app or an Ember app inside of a Backbone app or vice versa. <laughs> right. Or, and I mean, like, and when when you say that out loud, it sounds kind of kind of ridiculous. But there are a number of places that are doing this in the real world right now. I mean, Instagram, for example, they they have a, a native app that has React Native in parts, right? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. it's not all it's not all Objective C, it's not all Swift. Yeah. I actually don't know what percentage is which, but they have multiple parts of the app that are rendered by react native instead of uh instead of just with straight up uh coco mm-hmm. interface code it's awesome and it's bonkers and but it's don't weird, we already have that it. it's called an iframe <laughs> no oh my god no 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 <laughs> don't get me started on iframes i have i have some off uh uh off off list or off off the off the record things to talk to you guys about well, that sounds iframes. pretty dangerous mm-hmm 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 well, tell us about React Native. Uh, yes. So speak, speaking of React Native, I've now been working on a React Native app for the better part of a year. I think I officially started working on this app in January or January, July. Um, and uh, and I'm, I'm continuing to, to maintain it, add new features. Um, and it's it's been super, super awesome. I've, I've learned a ton about um, native development. Uh, but like the biggest thing I found is that like regardless of how how you have what seems like a unified code base, like all your UI code, a lot of your state management code all lives in this JavaScript space, which is awesome. And you can do a lot of good work with that. Um, you're still going to need to do things on the native side. And that's mm-hmm. probably never going to go away. You're still going to need to dive into Android Studio or Xcode and make some modifications in order to get something to work, in order to get something to work robustly. Um, and And that's... That should be uh, that should be treasured, not rejected, and also part of your estimations all the time, always, always, always. Even if it looks like there isn't something that has a native a native thing, unless you can be one hundred percent confident that it only exists in JavaScript uh, in JavaScript land, it's you need to remember that there are two two sides to it. You really are making two apps when you build a React Native app, and um, one of the things that I found is that it's particularly important to be able to just focus on one platform first. For me, that's iOS. And I think for a lot of folks, that's iOS. Um, but it can also be Android for sure. Uh, and the other platform will take time to, will, will take additional time to get up to speed. So there are things, there are things that break, even if you're just working in JavaScript land, um, there are things that will break in uh, Android, but not iOS, iOS, but not Android. And you will have to go back and fix them. Um, and, and figure, figure out why that's the case. Um, and it's almost never the case that you can deliver both of those apps at the same time. Mm -hmm. Um, unless you've first finished one of them basically. Right. Um, but there's some really, really what I wanted to get to talk about is, um, some really cool things that are happening in the react native space right now. The first one that's really interesting to me is this thing called expo expo is, uh, 
uh, or, or Expo is a thing that allows you for rapid prototyping of stuff. Uh, but they have a particular product out now called Snack that allows you to download a, an app from the App Store and uh, create React Native little sketches, essentially, um, that render in the Expo app. So you're writing React Native code in browser, and it's updating in real time in this application uh, on your phone. It is so, so, so crucial to be able to test some stuff out like this. Um, the, the imports are a little weird, I'll admit, but I believe you get access to essentially anything on the NPM registry. Um, so like I can, like right now, if I have something I can import, for example, R from Lambda, which is of course, uh-oh, R is defined but never used. That's all right. So what happens if right now I do something like before I render will be R dot map, empty object, R dot identity. I bet I can probably get this, get a link to this somehow. Yeah, sure enough. Yeah, and it pulls in from NPM. So it, it's, a, it's a thing and it works. I made a rather dumb sketch there and you can check it out. Um, but it's like that alone is so crucial for being able to prototype stuff. Yeah. Like being able to prototype React Native code without having to deploy a build is like super, super key. Um, another thing that's out is navigation, which is fascinating because usually when you do a native app, the navigation is handled by the native side. Uh, however, a lot of a lot of React Native apps, for example, often tend to use uh, something that's called like a navigation stack. So essentially, you can go. It's like the um, like a reveal JS presentation almost. So mm -hmm. you can have pillars uh, or like main main stacks that represent like um, like main profile cart, something like that, main profile menu, something like that. Um, and then each of those has their own stack and you can be on any one of these stacks. And then in those stacks, you can have a certain number of routes pushed onto it. Um, and React navigation is a really intriguing thing that uh, kind of helps to simplify that in a way that like, otherwise you have to use the navigation experimental uh, toolkit in React Native. Uh, to work with, but that's that's not going to be a thing for very long. So you're going to have to migrate out of that at some point. Um, I'm not actually using React Native right now, but I'm really fascinated by where they're heading because they're really codifying a lot of what Navigation Experimental did in the main React Native project. So, um, and this is uh, both server or both uh, React Native and and browser uh, web React uh, friendly. So that's super awesome. Super awesome for shareability of code. Um, and just for like processing in general, it, like it's it, processing uh, or b building navigation into a React Native app is really awesome. If you're doing anything other than a single page app, it's super fascinating. Cool. I've been wanting to poke around with React Native at some point for a while, and maybe I'll mm -hmm. get there. Maybe I won't. We'll see. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, I um, a few weeks ago, I had some downtime, and let me tell you, the new Create React Native app. Uh, yeah. It's just like Create React app. It's just mm -hmm. like a bootstrapping thing, kind of like Vue CLI. Yeah. Um, you can be set up with all the files you need, and um, it has integration with Expo also. Mm -hmm. And you can just deploy it on your local network, and you can just open it on your phone or tablet, whatever you have. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing. I mean, it is simply incredible. Totally. One thing I will note about Create, Create React Native App, I'm glad you brought that up because I almost forgot about it. The trick is if you have like a certain stack in mind with Create React, uh, mm -hmm. when, and you try to use Create React Native App, you're going to have to do a lot of rework. Yeah. Um, so like it's it's really awesome to get to get bootstrapped, but like um, I'm trying to think of a particular example I can say without uh, incriminating myself perhaps. Um, is that like Create React Native App is um, okay. So, for example, um, you know the the Expo app is great, but there are a lot of things related to state management. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to, and a lot of like custom code you have to include um, in any React Native app. So, like you kind of have to you kind of have to eject to regular React Native yes, pretty quickly. Absolutely, which is, which is kind of not great. Well, and um, I, that's that's generally my criticism of both um, bootstrapping tools, both create mm -hmm. React things, um, the the ejection part. Yeah, yeah, 
Yeah, but if you but if you don't need that, it's so crucial. I don't know of anyone who doesn't need that. But if you don't need that, it's super cool. I think it's it, cool I think it's really helpful. good when you're just starting to learn it. Um, you know, yeah. just just in the those initial couple of weeks when you're trying to learn how does this thing work and what what is it all about? Yeah, absolutely. Also, like, when you're trying to get buy in for the technology. Oh, totally, absolutely, absolutely. When what, when, what, when you can show yeah. somebody here, I typed on my computer and it just popped up on my phone. They're like, okay. Can I hire you right I'm here now? For this. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Rapid prototyping. Yeah. That's that's the thing that's crucial about React Native, and I think we're gonna see more like that as time goes on. Yep, I agree. Yep, yep. So to so to flip it up a little bit. Uh-huh. Uh, Brandon got a new toy. Uh, <laughs> uh, let's, let's hear about that. Yes indeed, yes indeed. So last month I picked up some Snapchat spectacles. You can now order them directly from Snap Incorporated in beautiful Venice, California. <laughs> Not to be confused with actual Venice. Um, but uh, I mean, they are an actual Venice, just a different actual Venice that has fewer canals and more hipsters. Um, but uh, I don't know, maybe Venice is kind of like hipster Rome. Anyhow, the uh, the Snapchat spectacles are, are super fascinating because they're glasses that you wear on your face, but that can record video. Uh, and that video is automatically updated, uh, uploaded to your phone next time your phone is in range of Bluetooth LE range. Um, they're not, it's not very high quality video, but it is like, it's not usually the thing that you'd use exclusively to like create content per se. It's really interesting because you can do, um, it's like you can get action footage. So like I, I got, spectacles in part to uh soothe my desire for a gopro because i don't really want or need an actual gopro i just want Um, a camera i can strap to my face and use while i'm biking mm -hmm. um for example to catch when somebody is driving 40 miles per hour down the down the uh cedar lake bikeway uh (laughs) the bike trail uh so that i can report it to the police because that's not legal and also could have killed me and like 15 other bikers who were on the trail at that time um but that's 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 that never happens, right? Nope, that happened Wednesday. Anyhow, uh, the the neat thing about spectacles is that you can use them to document a lot of things that you otherwise would never be able to document. So, like when I'm uh, when I'm biking to work, there are a lot of really beautiful views of the Mississippi River because I cross the Mississippi tr- River once or twice usually um, in order to get to work. And like the sunrise and the uh, the shadows over uh, the shadows. Uh, of like the skyscrapers in downtown. I just like, it's so perfect, too perfect not to capture. And I really, really adore being able to get that now. I usually don't want to stop when I bike because I'm usually commuting at, at that point. And I'm like, ah, well, you know, it takes however long for me to get into the office. And I just want to be able to make that happen and not have to like um, stop and do that. But like pic- picture, actual pictures are taken on the weekends. But in the meantime, to capture really awesome things that just kind of, serendipitously happen. Snapchat is really great for that. Uh, Spectacles are really great for that, I should say. So I definitely recommend it if you want to do something like that. Um, I'd also recommend it, like I brought mine into restaurants a couple times and use it to capture food um, and like food and conversations like in place, uh, which is interesting because it's like not a thing that you usually see. It's also kind of fun for like uh, weird physical comedy things that happen. Like, um, for example, my dog uh, or my parents' dog likes to give you a little like when, when you when you walk in to a room with her, she gets super excited and will like headbutt you. She'll she'll like run through you. It seems like, but she'll like hit your knee and be like, "Hi, I'm a dog." And like I can't capture that with my phone really because I'd be knocked over. But um, but the spectacles are really great for stuff like that too. Um, it's really great for walks, biking, hiking, stuff like that. Um, and other sorts of just like weird occurrences that happen. I'm trying to think of one other one that was kind of strange. Uh, I wore them on a 5k run. So that was kind of fun. Um, but other than that, I guess I don't have a ton of things that are super interesting uh, about it. It's it's not, it's it's only as interesting as the things you want to capture with it, I guess. Um, and it's really hard to compose something with it. You have to time it exactly right. You only get 10 minutes or 10 minutes, 10 seconds to record. Um, but some folks have done something really well with it. Shameless plug. Uh, we did something with the wild, the Minnesota wild about this. Um, and you can do some kind of cool stuff with that. I'll put the link in the show notes here. Now, can you save videos that you save or that you record with these? And can it, can you record several without having to go to Snapchat? Do they auto post if you're biking and you record 10 seconds? Does it auto go to your story or how does that work? Ah, so it does not automatically post, but it automatically saves to your snap memories. 
So if you open the Snapchat app at the same place where it go, if you saved your stories, it would save yeah. there. You can post them to your story or send them to folks, uh, but you have to do so manually. Uh, simultaneously, if you want to pull them to your camera roll, you can do that, um, but they'll be circular is the thing. Yeah. Uh, so that's the, it's fine to post those elsewhere, but it just kind of looks weird to other people because, because it's circular. The neat thing about it is you can do really fun things like hide emojis or text in the margins of a, of a spectacles video. I did that once or twice, which is super fun. Yeah, cool. I I hope I'll try a pair at some point. I don't know. Do you... it. I'll have to see yours sometime. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I'll I'll bring them when we record in person next for sure. Sounds good. All right. I I thought we could talk a little bit about um, just general security. Um, yeah. At Minibar, I was in a privacy talk, which pretty much dabbled into security as well. Someone presented for a little while, um, and then. It was just kind of an open session where people were talking about practices they do and and things they've heard about. And during that talk, um, Tavis or Mandy, who I will talk about in the Twitter section, uh, posted some tweets about uh, vulnerability in LastPass, which I think they patched just a day or two ago. Um, And this was in addition to some browser extension things, I think at least in Firefox for LastPass, that was the previous week. So... LastPass has had some issues, and I know they've had hacks before. And this this wasn't a hack. This was a security researcher finding vulnerabilities and then reporting it. Mm-hmm. So it's fixed, which is good. But just something about LastPass. We were talking about password managers. Um, most people kind of compare LastPass, 1Password, what is their key base? Dashlane. Key, or key dash, pass. Dashlane. Key pass. That's what it is. Um, so those are kind of the four that I've heard of. And I, I will be... or. I, I think most people I, I've heard who um, do this use one password really. Mm-hmm. Uh, somebody, uh, a friend of mine has a very interesting opinion about this. He prefers KeePass. Um, and that's because KeePass is a little bit older and it's not the, it's not the one that's in primary use uh, and it yeah. doesn't really synchronize things very well, uh, <laughs> which he sees as a feature. Um, I also use uh, 1Password because the Agile Bits folks are cool. They have an awesome Twitter account, which is not a way to choose a password manager. But Their Twitter is the best. Is, yeah, right? Um, and also, it's been the one that I've used that's least buggy, least weird, least um, like the, the Chrome and Safari integration is fine and I trust it. Uh, and uh, the I, I store it in iCloud, um, which is probably not a thing I want to mention on the internet, but um, so please don't hack me. Too late. Uh, yeah, right. Um, I store mine in a, in a blue box in the cloud. Ah, yes, I see what you did there. <laughs> um, and I just I just kind of prefer that. Every, well, everything is two factored anyway, so you'd have to. I, I shouldn't help. I shouldn't help whoever. You're whoever helping. Is leading all, Yeah, right. I'm like, haha, well, let me ideate as to how you could hack me. That's always great. Um, I, I'm going to just stop that sentence right there. Um, but yeah, one password is great. I, I like it quite a bit. Uh, it's interesting that LastPass, this is not the only LastPass vulnerability that Tavis has discovered, if I recall correctly. There have been a couple others, and they're almost always through browser extensions. So even yeah. though I just called out 1Password's browser extension support, I actually should mention that I removed the extensions for that reason, um, mm-hmm. because browser extensions are bad, <laughs> just in general. Uh, and this is another kind of extension of that. Yeah, I, I do use the one, br- browser extensions, but... It's more for convenience. I would. I'm more than okay with just typing one password in Spotlight. I have to type in my code anyway. It's almost uh-huh. right clicking and choosing one password in a right click menu is about the same amount of work as clicking the one password. Uh, what is it? The mini thing up in the menu bar, or just spotlighting in. Mm-hmm. For sure. I think you've convinced me. I'm gonna disable it. Yeah, for right. sure. I would definitely. I definitely agree with with that clearly. Like browser extensions always scare me. Like there's, uh, we use a password manager uh, for shared secrets, uh, and like one of the one of the components of it is like there there is a browser extension that allows you to c- click a button and copy in Safari. But I have no interest in in downloading that. No interest whatsoever. Yeah. I'd rather just select and copy from the page. I don't know yeah. why it's use the system integration, right? Things like that, you're just exposing everything you copy. Exactly. Like, I don't know. I I can tell you I. It's sometimes, you know, from one password, I'll copy a credit card number into a field, and I'm like, I need to copy something over this ASAP because I don't know what applications are snooping my clipboard, you know? Mm-hmm. So, well, there are probably events on clipboard changes, so 
if I do it in the first place, it's bad. But I try to trust my software. Um, okay, other security news. Uh, Jonathan, oh gosh, I don't know how to pronounce his last name. Zdarsky. Uh, Zdarsky, there we go. Yeah, that's good. Um, he was hired by Apple. He's been very active on Twitter uh, for both his photography and security research. Mm-hmm. Um, I followed him probably off and on for a couple of years on Twitter. And so rip his Twitter handle. He changed his user ID and I have not seen, he's probably moved. He's still on Twitter, but I don't know what that handle is. So yeah, he's probably not going to be nearly as, uh, as prolific. Yeah, that's for sure. I I wonder how little Flocker, his uh, mandatory access control uh, implementation for uh, Mac OS is going to develop if at all. Like it sounds like that's what he's going to bring to Apple. Yeah, I, I I wouldn't be surprised if we see something something like that come up in in a later version of macOS. If you go to littleflocker.com, it says the site is currently undergoing maintenance. Please try again later. Oh no, <laughs> he's he's been in active development of this project for I don't know probably nine ten months or something. So yeah. quite a while. Um, it basically is a kernel extension, I believe, mm-hmm. that will. Um, you you open an application and if it tries to access anything outside of its sandbox, it will let you, it'll let you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you can approve or deny something per application every single time. And yeah. so it's a good way to see. Okay, this application is snooping around. Let's block it, and mm-hmm. you're preventing that application from doing what it wants to. Absolutely, absolutely. I adore it. Uh, I use it on all of my Macs. Uh, it's a little like one of the things this is so dumb, but one of the things that saves me from is accidental remove commands in terminal because mm. <laughs> RM is, consi- is considered like you have to approve the, the access for the RM shell command or the RM executable yeah. uh, to, to, in order for it to actually go through. So if I do RM and it's too broad, I'll be like, Oh yeah, yeah, no, let's deny that. And then I get a weird error back in the shell, but it say it saves my bacon so many times. It's great. Um, it's all. It's also really helpful when, like, title, for example, title the music streaming app yeah. will request webcam permissions, and I'm like, no, no, you don't need that, right? It's yes. yes. There's a bunch of stuff like that, and it's like, uh, you know, I don't tape over my webcam anymore because I know that little Flocker is going to keep an eye on that for me, for example, mm-hmm. stuff like that. Yeah, I I haven't used it, but I've looked into it quite a bit. Mm-hmm. It's, when something it's, like that comes to macOS in the future, right? Right. Whether I, it's as user facing or or kind of internal. I have a feeling it might, if it does come to Mac OS, it's like as, as part of the operating system, it might end up being something like SE Linux that's either disabled by default in certain, in certain scenarios or, um, or like watered down by default in certain scenarios, um, Mm -hmm. which would be super sad because I love SE Linux and I love little Flocker. So like I, I would always want that on (laughs) and to the most restrictive setting as possible. Yeah. Do you, do you enable a firewall on your Macs? I do, I do, and I also don't have sharing enabled other than uh, air, air, uh, AirDrop on local networks. But that's mostly because I only um, that's only for my work laptop, and that's because I only ever use my work laptop in trusted Wi-Fi networks. Yeah, yeah. I don't think um, I've ever been anywhere in the last like ten years that hasn't been a trusted network. Mm-hmm. Actually, I there is one situation where I haven't. That was when I was working at a uh, certain NFL stadium. Uh, and I was, I was doing some stuff, an NFL, an NFL stadium in the state of Minnesota. Hmm, I wonder which one that might be. No way. Uh, yeah, I was, I was working there and it's really awesome because if nobody else is, is there when you're, uh, when I was doing an installation out there, when nobody else is there, it's like, um, uh, the Wi-Fi is like multiple hundreds of megs per second. Yeah. They have, cause they're, uh, preparing for a, a large, uh, final championship game coming up here. Oh, you mean the and big I, game? The big game, the sports ball event of the of the year. Yeah. Um, and someone was telling me they're planning on having it for seventy thousand people accessing it at any given time. Oh, for and sure. Like having connections, and that's insane. The amount of wireless spectrum sharing they have to do with tons and probably hundreds of high density routers and ugh, it sounds like oh, a mess. But sure. so they probably have a massive pipe. So they being there after hours sounds fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Uh, of course, it, it didn't help me f- for a particular situation because I was bounded by the uh, the laptop I had in hand to compile the C sharp app I needed in order to do a certain thing. C-sharp. But um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, that, like, for example, that that was the only probably non trusted network I was on. But then again, 
unless somebody dropped something off in this brand new stadium before it opened to the public. Um, and snoop me, I guess it's not that much of an untrusted network, but who knows? People are weird. People are weird. All right. I have one more. Yeah. So at the uh, mini bar 12, um, someone commented, you know, saying any podcasts and things and someone suggested the develop sec podcast. So developer security. And I've been listening to that. There are 71 episodes out since the end of 2013. And I've made my way through 25 in the last week. They're all like 15 to 20 minutes long. So a, a good length, um, small topics on um, how you might design an application with security in mind. How you might be able to test it and QA it. And right I, on. I quite enjoy it. Right on. I'm going to have to add that one to Overcast. All right. I think that about does it. Anyone have any last minute things? Don't think so. But I do have some Twitter followees. Ooh, I've been waiting three and a half months for this one. Right on. So this particular individual is a guy named Zach. He's Z- Zappleby on Twitter. Uh, oh, yeah. He is an I follow awesome, him too. He's a cool human being, an awesome developer uh, in the Minneapolis and St. Paul area. His Twitter bio says he's the 45th president of the United States of America, which sounds awesome. Uh, but we'll, we'll, I, I think we'll have to wait a couple of years, uh, but hopefully not, hopefully not that. Wow. Uh, I hope he is the 45th. I would be happier if he was the 44th. Wow. Um, but too bad. You know, too bad. It's too late. Yeah. Little America got messed that up for us. Eh? Uh, anyhow, he's a cool human being. He has great opinions. Um, he calls himself a podcast groupie, which is awesome. I do not know if he knows of the existence of this podcast, but Hopefully, hopefully he will soon because I'm mentioning him on it. Uh, and he's done some really neat stuff, a lot of which you can see on his GitHub or on Twitter here. He's just a gosh darn fun Twitter follow. So he is my first Twitter follow for this episode. Nice. Next up is Alma Minneapolis, A-L-M-A Minneapolis, NPLS, which is probably my favorite place in the state of Minnesota. They have a really awesome cafe. And it's not technical related at all. I just love Alma so much. <laughs> so you should go there. It's where all my friends go. Huh. Yeah, yuck, 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 yuck. I actually, so I had a, a group message on Snapchat uh, with a couple of my coworkers that was called All My Friends Go to Alma. We're now called the Sisterhood of the Traveling Specs because uh, <laughs> because I lent my specs to to them uh, a couple times. Uh, so, um, uh, so anyhow, Alma is great. You should you should go there. Um, and that about does it for me. I have more, more things, uh, more Twitter followers, but most of them are not germane to anything whatsoever. So we'll just leave those out. Alma's already pretty not germane, <laughs> but it made the cut. It did make the cut because Alma, uh, Alma fave food, Alma food comes from Alma. Too good. So I have three people here. The first one is Tim Smith. His Twitter handle is Smith Timmy Tim. He gave a talk at Minibar about CSS grids, which was just fantastic. Um, I'm really excited to work with CSS grids and he was, he provided a really good introduction and I have some links that he provided that I would like to investigate just some collection of stuff he's found helpful. Um, next person is Tavis or Mandy who did the last pass hacks. I followed him on Twitter. Um, I think just, I, just a few weeks ago when he started, um, looking into last pass, um, I think I've seen him come up before, but I hadn't followed him until just now. And then Sean Herber, who goes by um, Big Zafad, who's a developer for the Icon Factory. And I think right he's the one who will be writing the Phoenix app, which is Twitterific for Mac, which I backed on Kickstarter, which will come out hopefully this summer. So I'll be getting some stickers, a shirt, and a copy of, uh, uh, I don't remember, they have some system monitoring app, and then a beta and final access to Phoenix. So That's excited. awesome. What about you, Ryan? Well, I said earlier I didn't follow anybody, but I did. So fine, I'll tell you about them. So the first one is Mo Bitar, I think, probably. Mm -hmm. And so he made a really cool thing, which is called Standard Notes. And it's, you know, a note-taking app. I imagine that, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, But what I like about this particular note-taking app is that it uses a uh, open standardized file format and open server. So you can self-host if you want to which I think is wonderful. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, and because the standard, uh, the file format is standardized, you can host other apps if you wanted that use that same standard file format. 
which is also super cool. So if somebody were to accidentally make some kind of, I don't know, like Twitter digestion app, um, maybe that's kind of the file system it would use. Um, and then the other two people I hear I have, which would be Josh Close and More Man. Um, these are two people I actually work with, um, at my client site and, um, Josh Close, uh, I think he's kind of a, more of a .NET guy, but he's been doing a lot of React stuff lately, and awesome. he really likes the React, which is really cool. And More Man, whose name is actually Steve, um, he um, does like uh, pretty much full stack stuff, but he does a lot of DevOps stuff right now. Way cool. Yep. Cool. Way cool. It's good stuff. Yeah, I, I followed um, uh, Mobitar. I followed him because that standard notes thing sounds awesome. And it sounds cross platform too. Yes, it is cross platform. Um, like let's... super cross platform web, yes. Mac, Windows, iOS, Android, Linux. And, and, it's all great. And my favorite thing is you can self host with the standard file if you want. So For I think, sure. I think they have a, I'm pretty sure it's reference Ruby server thingamajig, but yeah. you know, whatever. I mean, it's, uh, if you, if you want to implement the spec, I guess it could be any kind of server. That's brilliant. Yep. Nice. All right. Well, where, where where can we find you on the internet? Well, you can find me just about everywhere, but especially on Twitter at Randomar. You can find me a lot fewer places than you used to be able to find me <laughs> because I I deleted two of my DigitalOcean VPSs just out of the blue. I was like, you know what? I'm done with these, um, mostly because they were kind of old. And I was just like, uh, instead of upgrading Debian from uh, Wheezy to Jesse. I was like, uh, it's, it's time to just uh, burn it all down and start fresh. But you can still find me at my website, which is brandon.mn, which is now hosted by a static file on Amazon S3 that will probably be updated at some point. Um, but right now is essentially just a page of text. You can also find me on Twitter where I'm brandon underscore mn. That's where I am most other places too, including but not limited to Snapchat, which is probably where all my fun hashtag content lives, uh, including basically uh, there were a couple days where I literally only tweeted the two catchphrases of the X-Files, the truth is out there, and um, I want to believe. I only posted the, that to my story uh, for 48 straight hours, which was a really fun time, and I think I'm going to have to do that again. Also, RIP X-Files, it's no longer on Netflix, but you can still watch it on Hulu, which I probably will, because it's a great show. But it's on Hulu, so you probably won't. It, yeah, that's true. <laughs> well, you can find me on my Twitter at Brian Mitch L. also my website, brianm.me, which will have links to any site you could ever want to find me on including vine which is currently a broken link i thought rip. i thought, I thought vine I died that. didn't isn't vine dead rip it is dead i still have a link on my site but if you click it it says "Uh oh we're having technical difficulties sure are technical difficulties like not existing wait so was yes. it was it vine.com yep vine.co oh vine.co oh, yeah. well dot com re- re- redirects to soap.com which is funny oh no and in, enjoy my site while it lasts. I have plans on redoing it a little bit. I think it'd be fun to do it in CSS grids and drop support that's anything older than about a two-month-old browser. Well, so, I think that would be fun, actually, yes. And I think I'm uh, going to drop the, the image lander page and just start with the content. Good plan. Uh, yeah, that's... Oh, also on my site, you can find slides for a talk I gave on my Twitter bot at Pimentos. On yes. Twitter. If you're interested in checking that out, take a look. Uh, you can find me on my bots at Morrison and Weather or at Weather by Brian. Yes, so great. I, your talk at Pimentos is really awesome, by the way. That was the one at Dev Jam, right? Yes. Dev Jam is what they call that, Studio 2. Yeah. Down, down in beautiful uh, King, Kingfield, Minneapolis, I believe. Beautiful downtown, sunny South Minneapolis. <laughs> Wait, that sounds familiar. Hmm. Where could that be from? Hmm. What is that from? 99% Invisible. Oh, yeah. Oh, Downtown that's Sunday, right. Oakland, California. Yep. Uh, I haven't listened to 99% Invisible for a while, but I do have a, a challenge coin from Radiotopia, Aww. which I did not I did not realize what a, cha- what a challenge coin meant until I looked it up on Wikipedia because I had not listened to that episode of 99% Invisible. But now that I do that, I realize that my challenge coin is up in the suburbs and I'm down here. So now that I've mentioned that, people can challenge me and i owe them a drink or something is that how that works or so something if you, are, if you are a radiotopia member and uh want a free drink come find me and and uh and i will be contractually obligated to buy you a drink i think because i will not have my challenge coin 
rip rip at self. <laughs> I mean, you you can just you can just support them again and get another one, I guess. Yeah, but I already have the one though. Well, you don't really have it. Yeah, but they're, they're all done with the challenge points this year, aren't they? I don't know. I, I I have the impression that they do it all the time. Oh, I thought it was so when I when I got mine, it was like not a not a not not a for everything. I know that's what they said, but I don't believe them. Ah, uh, gotcha. That makes sense. Well, you can find the show notes for this episode at thenexus.tv slash pk28. And hopefully you will see us or hear us in another episode in less than three and a half months. Yay. Hopefully.